Hi folks, Triss here. Thanks for listening to Mode and Prometheus, and thanks especially to all of you who have joined our Patreon. We don't run ads, so the whole podcast is supported by you. If you'd like to help out, head over to patreon.com forward slash Prometheus. Members get behind-the-scenes notes, early access, bonus episodes, and a lot more exciting stuff. Today's story is called A Walk in the Woods, and is about dreaming. The Capleton Hill Estate sits on the ridge, backing straight into Fletcher's Wood. To the east, west, north, the land falls away, as if in practice for the cliffs it will one day become. To the south, the transmitter mast rises like the sun, beaming its signals, voices and ideas into a million waiting homes. They say that if you stand on the tree line, where Crescent Wood Road curls up the hill like a breakwater, you can hear the leaves rustle in reply to the passing traffic, even when there is no wind to move them. Tree to tarmac, call and response. This is a true thing, but it is not a unique thing. Every wood, common and park whispers to the city, and the city whispers back. The wood itself is a remnant of something much larger something that once covered the ridge and rolled in waves toward the river, something that stood when the transmitter mast was just a standing stone. The wood remembers those days. It dreams. Have you ever wondered what the wood dreams of? Maybe it's best you don't know. Warren and Oxford arrive at Capleton Hill in a moving van. The flat they have bought used to be social housing, but was sold into private ownership some time ago. Much like the wood itself, Capleton Hill Estate is a relic of an older time. They park and get out. Ox is a breeze block of a man, sturdy and solid. Every part of him hard and reliable. Warren is slimmer, wirier, a sapling reaching for the sunlight. Ox looks around their new home. The hell is this? Ropes have been strung between lampposts and buildings. They are bedecked with branches and ivy. Most houses have a wreath of sticks and leaves, and leaf litter has been collected by the armful and dropped in a row of welcome mats in front of every door. If someone's dumped this crap outside our place, I'm going straight to the estate office. They have not. The doors on each side have their carpet of mulch, but their own is bare. Looks like a celebration, Warren says. Getting back to nature? Well, they can celebrate it on their own. If I wanted to get back to nature, I'd go live in a yurt. Ox's lip curls like wire in a fence. He hefts a box onto one shoulder. Can you manage any of these, or am I going to have to do it all? I'll help. Okay. Just leave them in the right room. I'll sort out where things go. Don't open them until I've had a look. Your organisation makes no sense. Okay. Warren moves to the back of the van. Before he's so much as touched a box, Ox is called... Lift with your legs. I'm not carrying you if you put your back out. Warren is still unpacking the next day when there's a knock at the door. He opens the door to find a young woman there. Maybe late twenties, short brown bob. She's got a sprig of mayflowers clipped into her hair, and she's holding a ceramic bird feeder in the shape of a little house, one with suckers at the back to attach it to a window. Hi, she says. I'm Annalise. I live next door. I just wanted to introduce myself. Oh, and I got you a housewarming gift. She thrusts the bird feeder at him. Warren almost fumbles it, but catches himself in time. Thank you, he says. Um, would you, uh, would you like to come in? Oh, please. I've been hearing the renovation work happening for the past few months, and also I'm very nosy. 
who is it, Warren? Ox yells from the bedroom. Oh, one minute, Warren tells Annalise and hurries to the bedroom doorway. It's one of our neighbours. Oh. Oh, okay. Maybe they'll be able to explain why the whole place is covered in muck. I was going to make them some tea. Would you like some? Yeah. Don't overbrew it like you always do. Warren leads Annalise into the kitchen. She looks in awe at the fresh tiles, brand new appliances, undercovered lighting. Wow, she says. My kitchen's something like 15 years old. I'm well jealous. Oxford was pretty set on not getting a fixer-upper, Warren says as he boils the kettle. I mean, it was more expensive, but it's easier. And he's out of work all day, so I'd have to manage everything, and that's not really a good idea. Do you work from home? No, I haven't worked for a couple of years now. He makes enough for both of us, and it means I get to look after the house. Oh, okay. Annalise looks like she's about to say something else, but then Ox appears in the doorway and holds out a hand. Hi, he says, smiling. I'm Oxford. Love the flower. It looks amazing. Oh. Oh, thank you. I'm Annalise. I live next door. Warren was just showing me around. This place is lovely. It ought to be, the amount I paid for it. Ox laughs. That tea done? Warren hands him the cup, which he takes wordlessly. I've got to ask. This place looks... a bit different from when we viewed it. Do you know what's going on? Annalise looks momentarily confused, then brightens. Oh, the decorations! It's the fate tomorrow, for the wood that was. Oh, it's like an event. (laughs) Yes, it's bigger than Christmas here. It happens every year, you've moved in just in time. Oh, that's big talk. Ox puts a hand on Annalise's shoulder and stares seriously into her eyes. Because I love Christmas. Annalise laughs. You are going to get on so well with my husband. Hey, have you seen the estate yet? Maybe I could show you around the place. That would be nice, Warren says, at the same time as Ox said. I think we've got things to do. Ox looks at Warren, then shrugs. Well... I've got stuff to do. You go if you want, though I don't know why you care. He gives Annalise a conspiratorial look and jerks a thumb towards Warren. This one didn't want to move here anyway. The estate is unremarkable. Low-rise blocks and yellow brick. Walkways hopefully decorated with pansies and petunias and planters secured to the railings. The windows are in military rows, and the ivy draped over the frames doesn't quite hide the impression of prison bars. So, your husband seems nice, Annalise says, as if casting a line into a pond. He's just my boyfriend, Warren says. Though I guess it's basically the same thing now. And yeah... He's great, and he puts up with an awful lot from me. I was so stupid with the packing. The kettle went at the bottom of a box. We had to unload the whole thing before we could get any tea on. Annalise already knows this. She heard Ox making his displeasure plain with the same volume as the renovator's drills. But she says, Oh, schoolboy error. Despite the almost aggressive ordinariness of Capleton Hill, there is something strange here. Warren can't work out what it is at first. The buildings look as solid and standard as every other estate. The green spaces all have the buzz-cut mow that the council loves. A one-eyed ginger cat with a swish-a-swash tail watches him lazily from a wall. Then he realises... It's not the estate. It's the people. 
the road is wide and open, but everyone he sees is walking the same winding paths, as if following breadcrumbs. And so are they, Annalise twisting through the space. A man in a suit takes off his shoes, rolls up his trouser cuffs, then keeps walking. After a few paces, he puts his clothes back again, and Warren thinks he catches a glimpse of a damp footprint. Annalise gives the man a wave as they pass. Eventually, they come to the edge of the estate, where a hip-high fence separates them from Fletcher's wood. A great tit sings from somewhere in the branches. Warren recognises the teacher-teacher call from when he was young, and his father would point out the different birds that came to the garden. He finds himself wondering what food he'll put in the birdhouse to attract them in. The wood might be good for birdwatching. He took ox out a couple of times on their early dates, back when they were still working out if they could grow in each other's soil. Ox had been polite enough, but clearly never that interested. He still refers to everything smaller than a red kite as the twittery one. Annalise leans forward, resting her arms on the fence. What do you think it's dreaming about? Dreaming? The wood. I'm sure it must be dreaming about something. Warren looks into the shadows the slumbering, rustling heart. It does feel that way, doesn't it? Don't tell, Ox, but this was actually one of the reasons I wanted to move here. I've always liked places like this. I thought you didn't want to live here. Oh no. I loved this place as soon as I saw it. But Oxford's a bit contrary, so, you know... Annalise, who feels she is indeed beginning to know, says, Right. Well, you're going to enjoy the fate tomorrow. You'll meet a lot of people who love this place as much as you do. They walk back through the blocks. Annalise tells them about the best cafes nearby, and which flats will sell weed. He suddenly walks into Annalise's hand, which has been thrust in front of him. She's staring at something ahead, but he can't tell what. They're on a road that runs between two blocks. There's a couple of parked cars, a set of rubbish bins. She pushes him gently backward. Let's... Let's go a different way. Is something wrong? No. It's fine. But still, she pushes him gently backward, not looking away until they round a corner. When Warren imagines a fate, he imagines a village green, the kind he's seen on TV but never lived anywhere near. There are stalls selling bric-a-brac and 17 varieties of Victoria Sponge. There are games involving throwing hoops onto pegs and the ever-present threat of Morris dancing. The Capleton Hill fate is not like this. The Capleton Hill fate has covered the road in leaf litter, spread it like butter until no tarmac remains. Ivy drapes from the windows. An array of Bluetooth speakers are playing birdsong, and people are guessing how many species they can hear. Warren and Ox walk past a series of boards where people are spray-painting stylized pictures of trees and animals. A skinhead has a look of intense concentration as he stencils a glittering kingfisher, like someone took a rainbow and gave it wings. Warren spots Annalise pushing a wheelbarrow full of oak saplings. She's with a huge man, six foot several, hair furrowed into intricate cornrows and built like an aurochs. She drops the wheelbarrow and bounces over when she sees him. Oh hey, you made it! Isn't this great? The huge man follows her. Ox looks up at him, warily. A coyote, sizing up a tiger. 
This is Daryl, my husband. Daryl, these are the new neighbours. Warren exchanges pleasantries and Ox shakes Daryl's hand. Daryl smiles with a flash of brilliant teeth. Quite a grip you've got there. Ox gestures at the fate. So, this is... an experience? Daryl laughs like a bear. I know, right? It's to celebrate the old forest. It used to grow all around here. Until we cut it down, Annalise says, annoyed at past generations. It was a crime. But honestly, sometimes, it's like it's still here. Ox can't help looking sceptically at the housing blocks, but Daryl says, It's true. It gets into your bones. We've got to get the trees to the distribution tent. They're all saplings from the wood that we're going to plant in the parks around here over the next few days. Like you're putting the forest back, Warren says. Yes! Annalise lights up. Exactly that. But hey, we've got to go. Are you guys coming to the wood later? The wood? Yeah, we're all going out there later. Give ourselves a good scare. Ox raises an eyebrow. A scare? Let me guess. A squirrel leaps out from behind a bush. Daryl laughs again. I like this one, he's funny. But honestly, man, you've got to be careful in the wood. Especially in the dark. It can mess you up if you don't respect it. Sometimes even if you do. I've got to say, you're not selling it. Ox laughs. No, seriously, it sounds great, but we're not going to have the time. Right, Warren? Warren catches Oxford's pointed look. Oh, no, we're going to be busy. Annalise does not look entirely convinced, but they roll the wheelbarrow away. Warren waves as they leave and turns to Ox, giving him a hard stare. You better not be going straight on me. He puts on a simpering voice. Oh yes, Annalise, I'd love to go to the wood with you. Oh, don't look like that, he says, rolling his eyes at Warren's expression. It's a joke. Might have been nice to go with them. With a load of nutters who were scared of trees. No thanks. Besides, you'd just end up tracking a load of mud and mank through the house that you'd need to clean up again. So they do not go to the wood. They do a round of the stalls. Ox buys Warren a box of tree-shaped biscuits and a cup of tea, and doesn't let him buy birdseed. They return home, and Warren watches the crowd gather from his window. At some unspoken signal, as the sun begins to fall, they troop off to Fletcher's wood, two by two. At the briefest of moments, Warren is no longer Warren. He feels soil around his roots, talons gripping his branches, leaf litter crunching under his cloven feet. He feels the tang of iron, calcium, phosphorus on his paths, and he sees himself looking out through his window, and he feels hungry. The wood dreams. Annalise thinks she knows what the wood dreams of. She thinks it dreams of sunlight and rivers and leaf mulch melting into earth. She is wrong. The fate is over now. The stalls are packed away, the leaf litter swept up, though the stenciled boards will be left until the council take them away. But the wood still dreams, and Capleton Hill Estate dreams with it. Ox is at work in his skyscraper when Warren opens his door to find Annalise there. She hands him a shovel and says, We're going planting. So Warren takes the shovel and puts on his shoes, because of course they are, this is the most natural thing in the world. 
They take the bus to De Montford Road, where a grass verge separates the street from the houses. Darrell is already there, as is the skinhead and a few other people Warren recognises from the fate. Daryl gives them a high-vis jacket and a hard hat. Do we really need this to plant a tree? Warren asks. No, Daryl says. But you'd be amazed at how few people ask questions when you're wearing one. They dig holes a half metre wide and deep, into which they scatter some of the leaf litter from the fate. Into each one goes a sapling, only a little shorter than Warren the hole filled with soil and compost before being watered in, and the whole thing mulched with more leaf litter. Finally, a fence is placed a foot out from the trunk, and a forge notice attached about how this is a planting scheme from the council. The trees are placed in a regimented row. Not natural, Annalise says, but it'll help them blend in. The wood will take its own shape when it's ready. Just as they have finished planting the last one, a jay lands in the sapling's branches. It looks at them for a second before flying away, and Warren understands. The wood knows. The wood is pleased. And the wood still dreams. Warren does not tell Ox about their expedition, He understands that Ox would not approve, would likely phone the council to let them know. Ox has already told him not to go into the wood. Should have chopped the whole thing down, he'd muttered after they'd come back from the fate, and Warren had felt a rustle in the back of his mind. Warren had made the mistake of mentioning Annalise's comment about the wood dreaming. Dreaming? Ox had snorted. What the hell could a tree dream about? It's the larval stage of a doorframe. Oxford has no interest in trees. He likes cars and beer and archery. He pays for them both to go to the archery club once a week. It's not Warren's thing, but he goes anyway. I've already paid for it, Ox says. And so it is with some trepidation that Warren crosses the boundary fence and walks under the canopy. He knows what comes with Ox's disapproval, but Ox is at work, and will have at least one drink on the way home. He has time. The wood whispers as Warren walks into its shivering heart. It breathes with a thousand stems. It shifts as it remakes itself day after day, Mouse to corpse, to loam, to tree, to seed, to mouse again. Walk the paths of Fletcher's wood, and you will see the charred ring of a fire. All trace of those who warm themselves around it long gone. A shack of branches, offering rudimentary shelter. Was it built by a vagrant? By children? Did it push itself from the ground like a fly trap? You cannot tell. Climb toward the great oak, but curl off the path before the stunted holly, and you will find the wellspring of an old river. It is now culverted, a sewer running under the estate, but the wild hunt still ride down its course one full moon and four. The great oak itself no longer bears visible scars of where the hanging cage was once fixed to its boughs holding witches and thieves until they were nothing but crow food. But while they may not be visible, there are still scars, a memory of metal in the heartwood. And here, Warren thinks he knows what the wood dreams of. He thinks it dreams of being whole again, dreams of the wood that was. He is wrong too. He hears the yip of a woodpecker from somewhere in the trees, and steps awkwardly across fern and bramble to find it. He never sees it, hears the call flitter from tree to tree without ever showing itself, but he does find what's left of another. A spray of feathers, a detached wing, something that might have been an organ, lying dark and gelatinous nearby. 
Sparrowhawk, most likely. It happens. This is the wood. Things die here. He does not hear it again until the sun begins to drop, and the shadows creep and spread. Warren has returned to the boundary fence. And it's here that it comes again. A call sharp as a knife, regular as a church bell. And he sees it. Not on a tree, but clinging to the side of one of the housing blocks. He blinks. And then the block is not a block, or not just a block. It's also a tree, several trees. And the afternoon sunlight darkens under a canopy that wasn't there a few hours ago. He blinks again, shakes his head, but the vision won't clear. The estate is still there. A ghost beneath the wood, and then it is more solid, and the wood is the impression. It's like both occupy the same space, and his brain can't decide which is the illusion. And in that seemingly endless moment, Warren feels his own leaves unfurling. Fletcher's wood grows around him, through him, but grows as wrong because it has always been there, laughing at the axes which cleaved into the heartwood because what could they ever do against the forest? In that moment, he sees the city, every street, a track, every square, a glade, and he is it, and it is him, and there is no difference between brick and bark. Annalise joins him, picking her way through the ghostly paths. You can see it can't you? What is it? The wood that was. She takes his hand and leads him in. Their feet rustle through leaf litter that covers the tarmac. Trees grow into and out of buildings. Rubbish bins sprout branches of holly and hawthorn. There used to be a lot more of Fletcher's wood, Annalise says as they pick through the trees. It covered all the land for miles around. It was cut down hundreds of years ago, but for some of us, it's still here. They are not the only ones here. There are other people he recognises from the estate, and all of them walk the paths, step over brambles, brush away branches. Warren realises that if he has gone mad, the delusion is shared. He yelps as a bramble twangs back toward his face, and the thorns stab into the hand he raises. He looks at it. Blood wells slowly from a scratch in his palm. It's real, he mutters. As real as we are, Annalise says, then puts her hand out to stop him and crouches down. Look. A family of boars are walking through the trees ahead of them. One adult, and a clutch of piglets. Annalise pulls Warren closer to the ground. The mother locks eyes with them as her litter scamper away, then follows. Annalise is panting slightly and licks her lips as she stands. How cool was that? As they walk off again, Warren notices she is leaving tracks. Not footprints. Paw prints. So is he. She leads him, he thinks, around the back of the estate. It's hard keeping track of trees and concrete at the same time. They curl around the undergrowth too solid to push through and backed with yellow brick walls climb over a fallen trunk and startle a deer which bounds away in a crash of leaves. And then he sees the river. Still young here, lithe and fast as a whippet. Annalise places her hand in the water, then flicks it at Warren's face. This is a sewer now, she says, but not in the wood that was. Warren suddenly notices the light is going. He fumbles to look at his phone and finds it two hours later than he expected, and with the sudden clench of his stomach, the wood that was retreats. It's still there, just, 
but only an echo, an outline of leaf over hard brick. Oh, no, 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 he says under his breath. Are you okay? Annalise gets up, brushing off mud he can barely see. Yes, I've just got to get home. I didn't realise how late it was. Sorry, sorry. I'll see you tomorrow, maybe, or next week. I've got to go. Bye. He leaves Annalise staring at him as he runs back to his flat, trying to think up what he'll say. Ox is waiting when he gets in. Where have you been? I was out with Annalise. We were... God, I should have known. Warren involuntarily takes a step back as Ox shouts. And that's much more important than making sure I can actually eat something when I get in, isn't it? I mean, I've only been out working all day so we can pay this damn mortgage. Yes, I know. I'm really sorry. I lost track of time. Was your phone charged? Ox's voice has gone tight, like he's trying to hold the beast in. Yes. I just... Right. So you were just too stupid to look at it. I just lost track of time, Warren snaps. I'm sorry. I'll sort dinner now. Ox stares at him, mouth slowly dropping open. Warren goes red as he realises what he just said. He isn't sure if he's ever talked back to Ox before. Don't bother, Ox says eventually. Have an easy night. You've had a hard day. I'm going to go out. I'll get some takeout on the way back. As he pushes himself off the worktop, his hand catches against the bird feeder. The hell even is this thing? He mutters, shoving it onto the floor where it shatters. As Ox leaves, he says, I'd appreciate it if you didn't talk to that woman again. I don't like her. Warren wakes briefly in the night. It is around 2am, and he feels the mattress dip as Ox rolls in, smells the beer and rum on his breath. You awake? Ox mutters into the pillow. Warren pretends not to be, and Ox rolls over. Warren lays there for a couple of minutes before he drifts off again to the sound of rustling leaves and softly beaten wings. He wakes again to streaming sunlight, late springtime warmth, and the loudest bout of swearing he's ever heard Ox give. He's still blinking himself into consciousness when Ox bowls his way around the bed and shakes him. What the hell did you do? What? Warren looks at the room. Twigs and leaf litter are scattered across the floor in the duvet. A single large brown feather rests on the window ledge. Muddy paw prints circle the bed, like a large dog walked in, walked round, then out again. Without seeing it, Warren knows the whole house is like this. I didn't do anything. I was asleep. You know I was asleep. Ox growls his frustration and shouts at the ceiling. The hell is wrong with this place? He paces back and forth in front of the bed, smudging the prints and kicking aside the debris. It's her. I bet it's her. That bitch did this somehow. How would she? Warren tries, but Ox isn't listening. It's her. I know it's her. He's about to thump the wall, but Warren can see him check himself as he remembers the size of Daryl. Instead, he rounds on Warren, who shrinks back as Oxford presses in like a colonising army. Warren can feel the heat from his chest, see the swell of muscle in his arms. Warren remembers finding these things beautiful. You will not talk to that bitch, Ox says, yells, though Oren is barely a nose length away. You will not go to the wood. I will burn the whole thing down. Annalise rings the bell an hour after Ox has stormed out. Are you okay? Yes, of course. Why? Annalise rolls her eyes. We can hear him through the wall. 
Warren visibly wilts, lets her in and moves to the kitchen, putting the kettle on and getting out the tea. I'm sorry, he says. He's not normally... I mean, he doesn't... Doesn't he? Isn't he? You've not been here that long, and we've heard him so many times. No, well, not like that. This place is just getting to him. That's not an excuse. Annalise twists her mouth, cradles her tea like a child. Please, be honest with me now. Has he ever hit you? What? No! Has he ever made you think he might? Warren tries to deny that too. Finds he can't. Annalise shakes her head. Why are you with him? Because I liked him, Warren says. Because he was sweet and funny, and he made me feel like I had bluebirds flying around my head all day. Does he still do that? Sometimes. Annalise just looks at him. You never get to keep the bluebirds, Warren says, and winces at quite how stupid that sounds. Look, I'm sorry, all right, and I'm not stupid. I know he can be difficult and mean and just... Yeah, I know. And sometimes I do want to leave him. But then he'll smile or say I've done something well and it's all okay again. He shrugs. Besides, I don't know where I'd go if I did. I haven't had a job in years. Nothing here is mine. Nothing is mine. Annalise puts her tea down. Okay. But just remember, if you ever need a boat hole, we're right here. They clean, sweeping up the leaf litter, scrubbing away the prints. They take it to Fletcher's wood and dump it over the fence, returning it home. They go back and Warren makes more tea. And he asks Annalise about her husband. And they buy a pack of cakes from the local supermarket and eat them all, one after the other. Outside, the sun climbs and then starts to fall. And neither of them notice because the day is going so well until a key turns in the lock and Ox is home. You've cleaned, he slurs. Good, good thing. He's drunk, Annalise mouths to Warren. Warren's eyes dart to the door to Annalise, trying to say, be somewhere else. Ox stumbles toward the stairs, then looks up and sees Annalise in the kitchen. You, he growls, then turns to Warren. I told you not to see her anymore. She's my friend. I told you, Ox shouts. He's close now, close enough to smell the beer, see the individual bristles of his beard. You know how much I do for you. I put this roof over your useless head. Don't talk to him like that, Annalise snaps. Ox turns to her, like a truck driving across your lane. And the hell are you still doing here? Get out, before I... And Annalise is looking at Warren when she says... Before you what? Ox's hand slams down on the worktop next to her, so hard the kettle bounces. Before I do something you might regret. Annalise is looking up at him, and her face is solid, but her heaving chest gives away the fear. Ox is a head higher, and twice as wide. She tries to move away, but is blocked by one of his girder-like arms. Warren puts a hand on his arm. Ox? Leave her. But he's cut off as Ox's arm lashes out, smashing his face like a hammer on an anvil. 
and Warren has dropped to the floor. He feels blood in his mouth and spits onto the tiles, leaving a pattern like a rose. Ox is staring down in shock, looking at Warren and his arm as if he isn't sure how the two things are connected. Annalise ducks out and helps him up. We're leaving, she says. Ox just keeps staring. They're most of the way to the door by the time whatever is short-circuited his brain finally writes itself and he staggers after them, the adrenaline not quite enough to sober him up. Warren? Warren! You will stay here! But Annalise has already hurried Warren out the door. Ox doesn't care. She lives next door, he'll hammer it down if he needs to. He feels strong, the way you can only feel after you've beaten down a smaller man. He feels power. He feels unstoppable. But when he reaches the door, the estate is not there. There is no next door. The wood that was has spilled into the world, and what should be comforting brick and concrete is a mess of boughs and leaves. Warren. Warren. Ox yells through the trees, screaming to the canopy. Warren. I'm going to find you, Warren. I'll burn this place down if I have to. He crashes through bramble and thorn, kicking them aside, crushing them underfoot. But Annalise and Warren are gone. There is no sign of them in the trees. Then don't come back, he yells. Starve out there. He turns back to return to the flat, but the path he followed is gone. The trees have turned him around, lost him more effectively than any mirror maze. He doesn't think he's come far, but it's like the estate never existed. There are only trees, stretching all the way down the ridge. There is the sound of movement somewhere close by. Warren, he says, uncertain now. There is no reply. More sound. A rustle of leaves. A crackle of twigs. Now on the other side. A growl. And it is Ox, of all people, who finally understands what it is the wood dreams of. The wood dreams of prey. The wood dreams of devouring those who fall under its canopy. The wood dreams of wolves. Murder Prometheus is written by Neil Merton, the voice of the city is Kate Angier, and with music and production by me, Tris Oten. For bonus episodes and behind the scenes content, join our Patreon at patreon.com forward slash Prometheus. If you're not ready for that kind of commitment, please rate and review us on iTunes, Spotify, or wherever you're listening to this right now. Our next story is due on the Falcon Moon, the 1st of August, and is about a place where falcons never fly. <laughs>